Hey guys, welcome to CarCast. I'm Matt, the Motorator D'Andrea, with Bill Goldberg. Uh, ho, ho, ho. Coming in uh, from Texas. Uh, we're going to have a fun show today. Well, we've got some interesting stuff in the news. In, in a light news area, like car news. Like, although yeah. it always seems a bit light because nothing's going on, but there's some interesting stuff. And I had a good conversation with our friends at the Peterson Museum recently that I, I want to tell you about. Uh, before we get started, we'll remind you about Dodge Power Dollars. For every horsepower of your new Dodge vehicle purchase, you'll get $10 off. So peeling out in a Dodge uh, Charger RT scat pack, hey, no problem. You get $4,580 off. So, uh, Reach out to your Dodge dealer. They still got to sell some cars. Come on now. <laughs> As he sits in the garage, he's over with all the cars behind you. I'm just um, trying to provide a good setting for our viewers. Uh, it's good. I saw your, uh, uh, your picture up on social media the other day of you got a couple of your cars just lined up. In, in storage, I know when you made the move out there, everything's sort of scattered around different storage units and stuff as you as you get situated there and you know and, and get the barn set up for one and all the animals and get the new garage built and all that stuff. So uh, it, it is nice that you have a few toys there at home. <laughs> yeah, thank, uh, yeah, thank God this is the only room I have uh, for any of them. So I shoved two of them in here for sure. But yeah, I had to go get the Daytona yesterday. Uh, at least show it with the sunlight was like uh that's the first time the car's actually been out during the day so um you know man everybody's uh everybody's getting antsy um yeah. the country's opening up you know on different levels and uh it gives me an opportunity to, to go give my baby some air yeah you know uh everybody's really starting to feel that quarantine fatigue and uh people definitely want to go out um we still get over here we're still getting some press cars they're they're doing a very good job of delivering the cars the guys are masks and gloves and they're wiping them all down and everything's a key fob now so the key fob is sanitized and it's in just like a ziploc bag and they hand you the ziploc bag obviously they can drive around with it with like that in the ziploc bag and you know so some of the companies aren't doing it some of the companies are uh i think um uh I think it was Ed Lowe from, from Motor Trend uh, that uh, tweeted out a little while ago saying that they photographed more cars like in the last 30 days than they have in any other like single month. It's been in, in isolation. One guy just takes the car out and he has to photograph it and as much as he can without all the, the lights and the crew and all that stuff. But just trying to get as much uh, content as, as we can. Um, and last week I thought our shows were good. The chat with Russell Carr from uh, from Lotus was was fun to have him come in from uh, you know to video chat with us from uh, from the UK and then uh, Adam and I spoke to uh, Jim Farley the COO of Ford mm -hmm. and uh, I, what I like about Jim is he's a real car guy that is running a car company. Afterward, we, we were exchanging just a couple personal emails and we won't get into all of it, but we were just sharing stories and some photos and, you know, he's got a GT40 that he, that he vintage races in Europe and out here he's got a Cobra, he's got a vintage like big block Cobra. Oh, I think it's big block. I think it's, it might be a 289 Cobra that he, that he races out here. And he's just got some good, good cars, you know, he's, he's, and he's really into it. And I was like, oh, you know, just let you know we've got a couple documentaries up on netflix the willie t ribs and, and shelby's like i've seen every one of them three times uh, <laughs> and i was like all right the car good. guy with a lot of time on his hands yeah, yeah and uh, every documentary and, and he was home as well he was like yeah i'm home of quarantine and my hair's great and long and and what are you gonna do but um uh anyway so i talked with the friends at the peterson museum about what do they do? When do they open the museum and how do they start doing events? Cause we're going to do our car cast live event there. And they said that um, they will be opening the museum fairly soon. There's all new rules they're trying to put into place and, and cleaning and all this stuff. And they limit the amount of people that are in there. The, the museum is big enough that just walking around the museum with your family and seeing the cars. Uh, I don't think that's big of a deal. You don't have to really get close to anybody. If you think about a lot of the museums, unless they're taking a group and moving them from room to room with somebody making a speech and everyone's jammed together, this isn't really that. Um, so I think uh, uh, they, they will be able to do that. As far as live events, um, their car shows and gatherings, 
they've had a lot of uh of of luck doing them virtually they they put the call out to anybody around the world by the way people who couldn't normally make it to the museum send in videos send in like 30 second videos of your car and they're doing like a cars and coffee gathering and they're using zoom and, and they're using youtube and they're streaming it all live and uh it's it's turning out well to the point where i don't think they're going to stop doing that even if they have live events there in in gatherings those gatherings will be a little bit smaller but then there will be a virtual aspect of it so well, yeah i mean think about it from a business model i mean you want to get to as many people as humanly possible and, and not everybody's fortunate or unfortunate enough to live in la that that's exactly right so we struggled with this with our carcast live event is is we want to do the event um last year was it was fun and we've got a good amount of people there for our first time out and the live podcasts were good uh this year we may just do it virtual but we will all participate you will i will adam will people from all around the world can submit videos of their cars and again we'll probably do this in july and then we'll we'll vote on uh, uh different cars your pick my pick adam's pick i don't know best in show or people's choice or something i still have uh, a, a stack of uh of of hats and swag and gift cards from our friends at jegs jegs is going to be giving out they don't even know this yet but jegs is going to be giving out <laughs> 250 dollars gift cards to four category winners because i've got those sitting here from the last car event and they said no problem hold on to it do it for next time and i was like great thanks guys you guys are awesome um so we may do a virtual uh uh car cast live event and we'll do some podcasting as well and we'll do it all in video and and audio and uh hopefully everybody will participate so we're I think we're aiming for like um, July event. Uh, you, you know, also as, like you said, as the country starts to open up a little bit, it gives everybody a little bit of a opportunity to go outside and stretch and soak up some sunshine, some sunshine and, and uh, maybe shoot a little video with, uh, with their car, which we would love to see. Um, I know that the Peterson said their, their first cars and coffee event, they, they got cars, from Dubai, from China, all around the U.S., uh, all just all around the world, they're just getting uh, car submissions, and I'd love to see that too because I know we've got fans listening um, uh, all around the world. There's there's people that reach out to me on social media. I know as you as well, saying uh, you know we we don't get this type of car there, and then of course some some of the cars they get we don't get. We'd love to see that as well. So anyway, it's kind of a neat idea. Oh, so what they told me was we're all super bummed like adam especially monterey car week is canceled now the vintage racing they're still on the fence that can be its own standalone event like a lot of vintage races but pebble beach concourse is is canceled the quail events canceled the the lemons event that they do up there concorso italiano like all the car show gatherings everything's canceled the auctions are canceled so the peterson wants to do all of the car events online they're they are going to reach out to all the people submitted for pebble beach and let them show their cars and uh they're going to do a virtual monterey car week and it's going to be the same dates as uh car week in august and give everybody else to to see the it give everybody else to see the cars and submit cars um but i know there's a lot of like video coverage and some some tv coverage of monterey car week although that's kind of slim uh the peterson having them sort of quarterback this effort is kind of nice but because it does give people a single destination to go right to watch videos basically you watch them for free and go yeah i can i can check out motor trends coverage if they are doing it which they normally did a tv thing i don't know if they are now uh it doesn't make sense unless they do you know uh, like a previous version um uh, so it's, it'd be kind of interesting to see the uh, uh the peterson museum do this but uh, so far they've they've got a lot of submissions a lot of fans watching uh what they've done you know, just their cars and coffee events. Yeah, with the quality of all of their vehicles, uh, any new content of any kind right now in the automotive space is to be clamored after, for sure. Yeah. Um, you and I were talking and a minute ago. I even watched that Joe Exotic crap the other day. 
Yeah, yeah, you know they're making a, a oh, scripted mine. series with Nicolas Cage. Nicolas He's gonna, Cage, yeah. just He's perfect off. for it. Uh, he, he he really is though. He always he's so nutty, but I always think he does a good job. I could sit down to any good or terrible Nick Cage movie and just watch it. <laughs> yeah, because he's such an interesting individual. He is, and he's a bit of a car guy as well. There's a couple of cars that he's owned in the past that uh, I believe were part, maybe still are part of the Peterson Museum. I think they have like this purple hot rod that he owned from back in the day. Which is funny because I remember moving out here 20 something years ago and Symbolic Motor Cars had a little showroom like on Wilshire and I forgot the cross. I don't know if it was like a Sentinella, something Wilshire and something. Um, and I believe that car was in the showroom at the time. And uh, I just stopped to look at it and like, this is crazy. Why do you have a purple hot rod in there? And they're like, oh, it's Nicolas Cage's car. I was like, oh, all right. I like there that. Go. I like that. Um, oh, speaking of nutty car collectors that you don't assume are n car collectors, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things that uh, came up with, uh, with Jim Farley and talking to him about Ford is not on the air, just privately afterward. He said, by the way, just a side note for fun, somebody with a really good big Ford car collection, Axel Rose from Guns N' Roses. I had no idea he even liked cars. And he's like, yeah, it's an admirable collection. You should try to reach out at some point. I was like, okay, I like that. You found anything online? I haven't yet. No, I haven't even uh, dug into it yet. He just sent me yeah, the that's email the, that's not long ago. Yeah, um, I'm, but I'm impressed. I'm impressed that that's the one he picked up of, of a – probably 500 top of his mind people that he could pull from. He's like, by the way, fun fact, Axl Rose, huge Ford collector. <laughs> I was like, all right, I like it. I like it. Um, surprises me that he's a collector. It doesn't surprise me that he's a Ford collector. Okay, yeah, yeah, I see that. Um, one of the things you and I were talking about would be, uh, you know, these virtual car shows and stuff that are happening online as the as the world starts to open up more, uh, does it change the face of car auctions? Do the car auctions that have had a lot of success actually recently doing online only auctions, will they continue to do them the same way they're doing them now? Or will the emphasis be on bringing people in, in the door? Are they gonna beef up the whole online auction game uh, or not, because because guys like uh, uh, companies like RM and Gooding have already put out statements and said, um, yes, cars are selling, but we know that is largely has to do with, you know, a lot of no reserve cars being auctioned. So they're going to sell no matter what. We can dig into the app. We can dig into the Hammer Price app and uh, and and see if they're selling below market, above market, or, or nothing's changed. We can dig into that a little bit more at another time. Um, but they are saying that they're getting record numbers of registered bidders. And uh, uh, I... I think that says something for sure. I think uh, this isn't just voyeurism at this point. These are these are people that are going through the, the process of registering to, to bid, to maybe throw down a bid. And I'd like to see the statistic that says, are they also getting record number of bids? I would imagine so. I think people are throwing in, as much as like we all love bring a trailer as well. And this is this is just sort of a version of that, that Gooding's doing, that RM is doing. I'm curious um, to see their, their docket. I'm curious yeah. to see if they're running the, the same cars that they'd be running if it was a live auction. I'm also curious yeah. to see who the, who the people are, the regulars are, mm -hmm. uh, percentage of them that are coming back to this, this you know, online form. And then I'm very curious to see the new people that it's bringing in out of whatever it is, whether it be boredom or whether it be – you know, just, uh, uh, just curiosity. Yeah. Just curiosity. Or, yeah. or, or, you know, maybe they're thinking there's some deals out there or they never had an opportunity to go to the actual auctions. And there is something different about being a phone in bidder 
versus going there and and well it I, means I, like, a lot to it means everything to di to to different people right yeah. i could never i could buy a certain class of car over the phone but there's no way that i would unless i've seen the car in person or know somebody who's been there and seen the car and who can vouch for it you know i mean i've been there in person a number of times and gotten turned upside down so you know yeah yeah, we've done that for sure. And there's the fun event portion of it, especially when you get into something like the Barrett Jackson events. Barrett Jackson Scottsdale is still a big, huge, fun event. And oh, yeah. and uh, for those of us that have gone, even if you pop in for like a day and jump on stage and auction off a car or a charity car, uh, it's 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 a great gathering to 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 catch up with a bunch of friends. It's that, a happening, uh, man. You're mu the like like minded people. And you know, every single person in that building in that tent is yeah. going to be a car freak, right? Nine times out of ten, you're going to see seventy five percent of your friends there, at least. You know, that's and, that's exactly and, it. And it's work, but it's actually not work. It's fun. It's play, and it's a it's an event. You know, they it, turned it into something much bigger than an auction. It's it's such a social event as well, and it's funny because SEMA and and Bear Jackson Scottsdale are two big events for me, um, and and Monterey Car Week, but uh, but SEMA and uh, and Bear Jackson, um, those are great times to to connect with a lot of people from the industry, a lot of the car collectors and and TV personalities and other podcasters and stuff. I see a lot of them at Barrett Jackson. And then I get to connect with all of the companies we work with, especially all of our East coast guys uh, at, uh, at SEMA. So they're, they're, those are the two big, like sort of social events there. We work the events as well, but there's, those are the big social events. Uh, and what are the percentage of people that you only see once a year? And it's at that event. I mean, there, there are a lot of people I could, name probably 10 15 that that's the only place that i see that meet you yeah it's the same yeah and and we look forward to it every year there's always like hey see is coming up we'll see you guys there what are you doing come by the booth or you know there's a gathering wednesday night or something along the lines of that but the only uh, the only issue is do you risk the chance of losing the money that's sitting in your pocket or your banking account <laughs> you have this affliction you know that you, you got to buy a car or can you just go and you know, keep your hands to yourself and not I, raise I, it and go, yeah, I'm bidding. I, the, the car thing is interesting, but SEMA, SEMA hurts me the most. I walk around SEMA and I get all the ideas for the car projects I have. And then over the course of the next year, I'm spending a fortune on these. On, on the yeah, cars. but you can do that in a second at Barrett Jackson. Yeah, so you can do that. The, 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 years, the, the yeah. 12 months that you accumulate that large bill that you acquired, you know, from the, all the ideas from SEMA can, yeah. be, can be wiped out in two seconds by doing this at Barrett Jackson. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, it's, it's a fun event. Uh, I'm curious to see where the auctions go. I think they have a lot of opportunity to grow those auctions uh, by doing them online the way they are. And it'll be, it'll be, it'll be fun to see how that grows, but I don't think it's going to take away from the events, especially now people are eager to, uh, to get outside and it's not going to be, it's going to add effect. to it. It's going to do nothing but make it bigger and better. I think, and I think, you know, the, these top echelon um, auction houses are going to come up with something outside of the box. That's going to be really cool the way to present it. Yeah. I'm curious. I'm, I'm interested to see. Uh, anyway, so we got some, uh, what's going on in the news and the news is, um, well, first of all, I've been driving a couple of cars, uh, two wildly different cars. I spent uh, a few days in the Lotus Evora GT. We talked a little bit about that already. Um, it was fun. I love driving it. You could never fit in it, Bill, uh, which we, we knew getting into it. Uh, and uh, even, even as I move this seat forward to, to be able to get a good uh, angle with the feet with the clutch getting in and out of it because now the dash is so close it's just it's interesting but here's the car that's it's small it's lightweight it's I don't know it's it's 30 3100 pounds 
Um, 416 horsepower, 3,100 pounds. It scoots around zero to 60 in four seconds, maybe a little less than four seconds. Um, I've got no problem with the engine, the 3.5 liter Toyota engine. It's got the Edelbrock supercharger on it. Um, it, uh, it makes 8.7 pounds of boost to get that kind of power. I, I think, I, I, I think it would be a little more special. Everything about the car I like, except now you're getting into that $100,000 price range, and it's such a competitive price range right now. Uh, when you start looking at, you know, sports cars and muscle cars, and Hellcats and Corvette C8 and GT350s and GT500s and Porsche Caymans and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and forget like some of the super sedans, you know, Alfa Romeo Giulia, M4, you know, uh, the coupes, like it's just a very competitive market. So I started it to seems think very indifferent at a, after this drive. It's it, I've I, never seen, I've never seen you. Like that. <laughs> it's I, I think the one thing I wanted to maybe make the car a little more special would be you've got, you've got this English design car. It, it's, it's still, follows the lotus mantra of being lightweight and small um and top-notch handling um but i think i would have liked to have seen if you're going to source an engine uh and and has nothing to do with the reliability and everything of toyota engine honestly if you would have just said it was a lexus engine i think it would have changed the nature of that car just the the outlook of that car if you would have said lexus instead of toyota um but let's say they sourced something english or something german for that car um uh maybe like a little twin turbo amg mercedes amg v6 would have been kind of interesting uh maybe uh one of the supercharged v6 engines from jaguar right? It's very similar here. 380 horsepower is what they have uh, before they get into the eights. I think you could have tuned that to 400 horsepower. Um, and you would have had sort of this British based engine that could be kind of interesting. Um, maybe, uh, maybe an Audi engine. I don't, a Audi did work with Spiker back in the day. So Audi did sell their engines. Um, I don't know that BMW does a lot of that, but they did at one point. Uh, AMG as a standalone company under the Mercedes umbrella, uh, they provide the engines for Pagani. They provide the engines for Aston Martin, uh, you know, all the V8 engines and a technology transfer. Um, I just think you said, Hey, Lotus Evora GT, and it's got, you know, it's got, it's got an Audi V6 twin turbo, or it's got a, you know, a, a Jaguar, you know, V6 supercharged. Um, and it's a hundred grand. I, I think you'd give it a little bit more attention. Now, that's just me being snobby about a hundred thousand dollar car. Everything else about the car is super fun. You know, I thought it, it was it was a blast to drive. And so the uh, power plant's your only issue. I and and not the function of the power plant. Just yeah. just the cachet. I understand. You know, I just think um, I see your point. And, and look, why do you get this car? Why do you get the Lotus of Aura GT? Is one is is some brand loyalty. Like we have brand loyalty with so everything. At least there's something in our life. Maybe you with Dodge, or maybe somebody with an iPhone, or what brand of toothpaste that we love. There's some brand loyalty. So maybe you pick up a Lotus for that. But also you pick it up because when you do roll up to that cars and coffee or do that Canyon cruise or something like that, you're going to be one of one or maybe two guys out there with that car. And there's going to be seven of everything else. And that does make it a little bit special. So, uh, but driving the Lotus, uh, of Aura GT, uh, like I said, had a lot of fun with it. Swap that out for another British car, wildly different. Um, and I can tell by the smile on your face. I think this is one of the prettiest cars on the road. Been driving the Aston Martin DBS Super Legera, a wildly different than the Lotus. Um, instead of lightweight, even though Super Legera basically means lightweight, uh, <laughs> it's not. It's not by any means at all. Um, I liked the DB11 um, and the Vantage. I drove the Vantage with its V8, its AMG twin turbo V8 engine. 
I drove the DB11 with the 600 horsepower twin turbo V12. And the DBS steps it up to 715 horsepower, still twin turbo V12. And instead of an aluminum body, it's largely carbon fiber. And that takes about 150, I think they said 159 pounds off the car through uh, a carbon fiber body and the optional titanium exhaust. If you get it, if you get the carbon fiber roof panel and the, the exhaust and everything else, it's 159 pounds most. If you don't get those things, I don't know, it's maybe it's like 100 or so pounds. What's the curb weight? 4,100-ish. <laughs> uh, it's The DB11 is over 4,200. It's like 42 and a quarter. Totally and different this car. Is around, totally different car. Um, uh, it's fast. It's, it's interesting because the DB11 is 0 to 60 in like 3.6, and the DBS is 3.2. But there's something about the DBS that feels faster. It just – it. It, don't get me wrong. It's it's not gonna be. It's not gonna feel like your Porsche 911 Turbo. It doesn't even feel like that Lotus. Um, it's still a heavy car. It's still a GT car. It's meant to be this Grand Touring car, um, but but some of the GT cars we're starting to see. You know, you think of the Ferrari Superfast, the 812, the TDF. You know. Uh, they're starting to really haul ass now. The GT cars are getting really fast. And I love the design of the long nose front engine or front mid, if you will. Uh, uh, I've always loved that style of cars. Nothing against a Ferrari 488 or the Pista or even the, the McLarens and, and the Lamborghinis. But uh, as cool as they are, they're not as beautiful i always thought of of this shape of car yeah and the aston Agreed. martin dbs picks up a few things it gives it a little bit more muscular version compared to the db11 mm -hmm. um and getting into it though it doesn't have the sparse supercarish interior like the mclaren does and 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 uh and this lotus the interior is gorgeous. The, yeah. the leather, the textures, everything is just wrapped. Everything in there is, is fantastic. Uh, they use the infotainment system, the electronics now they source from AMG. So they get the eight-cylinder engines from AMG and a lot of electronics from AMG. Um, the one thing that bugged me <laughs> is there's always a caveat, right? There's always a caveat to the rule. And I get in this brand new car. It's Base price is three hundred and ten thousand. The one I'm driving is three hundred and fifty-four thousand uh, dollars. Definitely something that catches your eye, right? When you're going in there to, to write the check, oh, yeah. three hundred and fifty thousand dollars for this car, and uh, I get in, I plug in my phone. There's no Apple CarPlay. There's no Android Auto, and I'm like, this doesn't this seem sucks. like, <laughs> you know, like I don't know, like. It's an expensive car, whether you drive it every day or not drive it every day, you kind of start to think, um, why? So uh, I reached out to, uh, to Aston Martin. I said, before I even talk about it or bring it up, I got to know what's going on here. You know, like, look, we, we talked to Rolls Royce when we're driving their SUV and there's no car play. And Rolls Royce said they designed their infotainment system to work at the front of the vehicle, of course, but also to the two screens in the back of the seats. And all of their discussions with Apple, um, there, was, there was no way to get CarPlay to work on the front and the back. And they said, until we figure that out, we don't want to do it. And maybe it's sort of them sort of strong arming, strong arming Apple to work with them a little bit. Um, I don't know. But uh, at least they had a reason. So I was thinking Aston Martin has to have a reason. They didn't just ignore this. And by the way, this wasn't a cost issue. This wasn't like, hey, man, let's add another $1,000 to the price so you get CarPlay integration. Oh, yeah. 50000 who gives a Give shit? Give me a break. Yeah. Right? They said that um, so much of the electronics and the infotainment system is sourced from AMG, but the deal with them is 
they are allowed to use it, but they're allowed to use a previous generation software version of what are in the AMG cars. So you'll never cross shop, let's say, a Vantage or, or a DB11 with an AMG GT, because if this is a decision maker, they need to cater to the boss, basically, who's Mercedes Benz. So, okay, I get it. Um, so what he did tell me was the Aston Martin DBX, the, the SUV that they've debuted that's coming out later in this year, will be the first official model with, with CarPlay. Um, and then it will end up in the Vantage and the, uh, and, and the, uh, the DBS and the DB11. They will all get it in the, technically the next model year. They will, they will get it. Um, so there will be, be an iPhone 20 by then. He, they will, but at least you'll be able to plug it in, and exactly. then maybe you could start doing some some version proofing, uh, for lack of better term. Once you can get the uh, iPhone to work, a lot of the software upgrades can be done, like on your phone and things like mm -hmm. that. So anyway, they had a good reason. They you know they sat down with AMG. They're like, hey, we want some technology. We want some engines. And they said, great, but you're kind of gonna get the, uh, the, the leftovers. Bird. You're gonna get the leftovers. <laughs> um, which is interesting because I, I I went and I asked for this car because uh, of the supercar that uh, was it Valkyrie I think it is um, the supercar that yeah. uh, that we That's love fun. so much um, and uh, in looking at that I wanted to get into this car again and that discussion led to uh, Aston Martin saying, Hey, we are developing our own six cylinder engine, our own in-house proprietary. I think it was a twin turbo six cylinder. Um, and they're going to keep their 12 cylinder, which they do develop. Uh, mm. so the two engines will be from Aston Martin are going to be homegrown, but they're saying that the six cylinder will always be paired up with some sort of hybrid conf configuration. Mm -hmm two-wheel drive or all-wheel drive or whatever. So the six-cylinder will come with electric motors and the 12-cylinder will be its, its you know, motor, all-motor vehicle. So I like that they were, were doing that. And uh, I guess that creates some separation between them and the AMG. When they signed with AMG, I was a fan. It was like, AMG cars are great. Uh, the engines are fantastic. Pagani still gets, he pays a premium. He gets them to make like a twin turbo, twin turbo 12 cylinder that they don't even normally make anymore. They just do that for him. And uh, I guess when you're spending, I don't know, million Must be five, nice, yeah. Yeah, a million five on a car, you can, car. You can put a $180,000 engine in that car and pay a premium and be like, great. Now I got, not only are they getting an AMG source, they're getting a unique engine built for, for Pagani. I don't yeah. think it was always that way, but it is now. So, uh, uh, anyway, that's kind of uh, interesting. Um, the Aston Martin, uh, it's gorgeous. It's fantastic to drive. Um, it has uh, a number of the uh, options, as I said, as you can find in the price, has over $44,000 of options. Um, does it uh, feel like it's 4,100 pounds? It, it still does. It does feel a little large. Um, the, the car physically feels big. It does feel a little heavy, um, but I don't mind it because um, – it, I just don't drive it the way I was driving, like the uh, the Lamborghini Huracan, uh, the Spider, the other day. Right? It's just uh, you're asking car, the car to do two totally different things. Yeah, and for for what this car is, um, I, I'll tell you, I, I think the Aston Martin is an easier car to drive every day than than the Lamborghini is, and the Lamborghini well, yeah. uh, Huracan is meant to be their their sort of daily driver car. And it is. I, I you know, hopping in and out of that thing all the time. But the Aston Martin is fantastic. Yeah. yeah. The Aston Martin is fantastic. And I would say that uh, history has shown that a lot of these, uh, these English cars, Aston Martins, Bentleys and whatever, don't really hold their value that much. But if you think of the previous generation DBS, the James Bond car, if you will, the naturally aspirated V12, which sounds fantastic. Uh, they're still trading at like $200,000. They actually do hold pretty, pretty well. Um, and, and I think getting the specialty version of it, which is why all these car companies make the unique special versions of it is to, is to re retain some value. 
um, uh, I don't know. I think this car potentially potentially could. I guess it's going to depend on how many they end up selling. But uh, the the DBS in my mind fixes some of the things that the DB11 didn't have. It has more power. It has a little bit more aggressive look. I like the grill design in the front, um, and uh, it drops a little bit of weight. Um, but also lets you open the hood and see all the raw carbon fiber and open the trunk and see the, the carbon fiber in there. They sent over this beautiful green, this dark metallic green cover color. Um, and the interior is sort of a brown and tan called chestnut and sort of a two tone, but the beautiful, the right shades of a brown and tan. Um, uh, I think when it's all tan, uh, it's, it's, it's too light. It just feels too old school. Um, I don't know. It just feels a little Ferrari 308 to me, but the brown and sort of a cinnamon brown. Uh, I think that does, car. I, I think that car is kind of in a class of its own. I mean, what else yeah. can you compare with that car? Well, uh, I would price say price-wise, performance-wise, lineage-wise. So I, I would say they would would consider their competition uh, the Ferrari Superfast. Um, I, I would say that the, the Ferrari is super fast, although I think the Ferrari is a little faster. Um, and then uh, you'd have to say Bentley Continental GT. Yeah. You know, uh, I think that would be the closest thing that you would get to it. I just don't think, um, I, I like the Bentley and it's, it's gorgeous, but it, it's still a little different. Like it, it's, a, it's a bigger car. I saw the new Bentley GT, haven't driven it yet, but when it debuted at the LA Auto Show uh, at their private event, I think two years ago, it's, it's, it's badass. And they're putting gobs of power in that thing. Um, but in my mind, I, don't, I just see one sportier and one just being the ultimate uh, uh, you know, super cruiser, and that's the, the Bentley. Uh, this car to me, is the best of both worlds. It's yeah, not, I think I think it no, is. Nobody does it like they do. Nobody can can teeter that line of GT and, and you know straight out sports car and yeah. deliver the best package of both than them. Yeah. Anyway, it's 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 a pretty car. Um, it's it's been out now. I think since 2018. I'd I'd be curious to know from some of the people that have this. Um, uh, how do they feel about it two years later? What was the cost of ownership? We know it's high for cars like this. All the crazy supercars are, but in a world, in a world that we live in, where you know some of the Ferraris, like the California and probably the Portofino, come with scheduled maintenance and stuff now to be more competitive and and more competitive in resale. Uh, what is Aston Martin doing in that realm? I haven't dug into it too much, but uh, I'm curious. Does this car cost you know three thousand dollars a year, or does it cost fourteen thousand dollars a year to own? You know, there is there is a big difference. Uh, you know, actually, I would even bring it up. Like we 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 talked about the. Uh, the Konizak, the crazy four seater with the uh, that uh, that uh, you're a big fan of, and um, at one point you were talking about getting together with a couple of buddies, sort of an investment group, and getting one. <coughs> What's the cost of ownership on on a on a Konizak Gamera? You know, I I don't know if that's come up yet because we're so enamored with how badass that car is. But what does it mean to own that car? We need to do some investigating. That's for damn sure. Because yeah. you're right. That, that that one didn't come up, but it's it's something to definitely consider. You know, once you look at the uh, the maintenance charges with these freaking high end supercars, thirty grand to change the oil. You know, you got to pull the motor in some of these cars. Yeah, brake jobs, thirty thousand oh. dollars. So now you're getting a Bugatti, Bugatti Veyron territory. So you have to kind of think a little bit about the Koenigsegg. Um, you know, I. I, I've said this many times uh, on on previous shows. I've always felt like if you're getting into that supercar world, you're spending a million, million five, million six. You think about how often does it go into maintenance? What is the real hard cost for the maintenance of that? What is the dealer and what is you know the manufacturer? What are they paying? I, I say schedule maintenance and everything on that car basically for life should be covered and just charge an extra 150 dollars I was just going to say, I cannot wait for a car company to come out and do that. 
just just say, hey, Bugatti, uh, uh, it's 1.8 million now, but we cover everything. We cover everything. It's it's I, it does something to us. It does something to the buyer, to 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 the psyche of something. I'm telling you, it's it makes all the difference in the world between. It's going to change the playing field if somebody when somebody does that. But just think about how we think and. And we can buy something for fifteen dollars on an online store and pay five dollars shipping, or we can buy it for twenty dollars off of Amazon and get free shipping. And you go, I kind of like the free shipping. Yeah. Like I feel like I'm wasting feel like you're money on them for nothing. Yeah, you kind of do, even though you're paying a little extra. You know. And you're like, ah, I just kind of like the free shipping portion of it. Or you like, can why even add it to the space? purchase price of the car for shit's sake. That's and then what I'm saying. Save yeah, it to have just, free maintenance, and people wouldn't even give a shit about the initial price, and they would see the value of the maintenance for free and go, hey, man, that's bitching. You know, they're going above and beyond. They're trying to do something different, and they're taking care of the people who love their cars. I would even argue that all of those cars would increase in value because there's no hesitation on bringing it in Amazing. for service ever absolutely right? it's all included that's fun you're sitting around waiting going oh i gotta take the bugatti in for service it's it's in june and then you're like oh it's gonna cost 30 grand no i get to drive it to the dealer and i get to drop it off and i got full schedule of maintenance now the but records then you're on that get car. everybody going in and getting their cars maintained properly then yeah. they're going to have to hire more staff. It's going to cost them more money in the long run. You well, know? And so is it better for them or is know, it worse for them? It's essentially prepaid. And if you think about it, the car companies that on warranty work, the manufacturers pay the dealers to do that warranty work for them. Somebody's mm -hmm. got to get paid. Uh, think of all of this money, this extra money. Let's say if you jacked up the price of a supercar, 200 grand, mm -hmm. uh, 200 grand arguably can sit in an escrow account and earn interest over the life of that car. True. Right. And so when the manufacturer says, Hey dealer, uh, the, it shouldn't make a difference to the dealer. Right. It shouldn't really make that much of a difference. Now the maintenance stuff, the dealer makes a lot of money, but the warranty stuff, they get paid by the manufacturer. Yep. So it's just who's writing the check. Right. It's not fair for the, you know, I don't even, it doesn't make sense at all for the manufacturer to go, hey, it's all, everything's scheduled maintenance. You guys got to just do the work. That doesn't make it. That's not going to happen. The Hold manufacturer up. is going to pay them, right? So the dealer is just going to be like, hey, man, bring your car in. They, they want you to bring your car in just like they would any other time. The difference is in you writing a check for an $18,000 oil change or the manufacturer writing right a check. And, and the manufacturer, like I said, could be earning interest on it or investing that, that money into... Uh, the next model or, or whatever i you know look e elon musk takes deposits on all of his cars so he can fund the next car you know so what's the difference between that and doing scheduling bmw i believe offers schedule maintenance packages you can buy the car for you know whatever you buy a car for 50 grand yeah. you get the schedule maintenance you get one version that adds four grand and one version adds seven grand to the price or whatever the case may be a good start you, you can make an optional you know hey if you you want it optional, I think you can make it optional. But I would argue, especially with these with these supercars where maintenance is key, it would absolutely help the value of the car, help retain the value of the car. Because I don't disagree at all. It, right? You're bringing it in. You're bringing it in to get work done. But um, Well, you're assured as, a, as the next buyer that, that the maintenance has been done regularly. Yeah. Um, which is everything. Anyway, that's... Uh, that's my thought on that's my thought on, on that. And those are the two cars that I've been driving. Um, in the world of electric cars, since we mentioned Jaguar as well, I will bring this up. Jaguar's next generation of the XJ. I love the big super sedan from XJ. Um, we've owned a few over here. Uh, we've had a long relationship that we love with with uh, Jag. I'm still driving one now. I'm driving the uh, the XF. Um, there's a lease on that. Hold on a minute. You're driving two cars at once. <laughs> uh, the XF is uh, a permanent car in the fleet, if you will. Um, uh, I work with Adam. He went and leased the car for for a few years, and uh, and then when he moved, he 
had trouble getting it in and out of his giant driveway because of the angle and it kept scraping and he kept feeling like he was hurting the car. So he switched to a, uh, uh, do an infinity SUV. He's got the big QX 80, um, big three row. Now he's got the kids in there and the dog and all that stuff. And it's fine. I was like, well, wh what are you going to do with that Jack? <laughs> and, it, and I said, let me, uh, let me just get that out of your way. And, uh, so I've got the, uh, I've got the, uh, the XF. I got to post pictures of the XF because, um, I changed the wheels on it. I put, uh, the 1552 uh, uh, wheels, a blacked out five spoke wheel on it. Nice. Um, uh, one of the sort of like one of the Ken Block style wheels on the Jack. And it actually looks good, man. It looks, it looks, it looks badass. Um, so I got to post some pictures of it before that lease expires. Uh, but over the, over the many years of working with Jag, um, uh, I like the XJ. I like, especially when we do our, like our Monterey road trip, Adam likes to just drive and hang out and get everybody together. And, and, um, you know, it's massaging seats and heated and cool and the sound system's great and plenty of leg room. That's the big sedan. Uh, but where does a, a, a company like Jag go in the future? And, and they've, said hey we want the xj to be all electric and uh, i don't know that it's going to have any gas engine at all but to your point earlier they do have a legacy here they have a design theme they have history uh, oh, yeah. uh you know um from xkss to you know xke so jag is saying we don't want to change the car. So as much as there's going to be a drastic change in going to electric power, design-wise, they don't want to change that much. It's going to have a hood in the front. It's going to be a long nose sedan. You know, uh, It's going to be a, a beautiful four-door. The interior is going to be very much Jag. Uh, even the I-Pace, their all-electric little SUV that they have, has a lot of design elements in it. And they're saying it's not even going to go that far. Like That's still a unique vehicle for them. That was meant to be electric from the ground up. This is going to be uh, an evolution of, of I assume a new platform, but a lot of evolution of the XJ design theme. Um, I think the one thing they said that they're going to do is instead of a conventional trunk, it will have more of a hatchback type of trunk, kind of like uh, the Model S. And just for m much more accessibility uh, and... Uh, and the idea of taking the big four door and, and being able to fold down some seats and open a hatch and, and turning it into a much more functional sort of a, almost the amount of space of an SUV at this point, but doing it in a, in a, in a sedan. Um, so the performance and the handling and everything else, but they said, don't expect a race car. The XJ was never meant to be a racing car, right? So it, it'll be quick, it'll move and it'll be electric and, uh, it'll be gorgeous the way you expect from Jag. Anyway, it's just kind of an interesting idea. I, I'm I'm a fan of it. I, I like it. I think if you want to race around in something, there are other cars that do that with even several other uh, uh, Jags uh, to do it in. And to be able to have this thing cruise and just be as quiet as it has been and as comfortable um, and then plug it in at night, I'm, I'm, I'm down for that. And it is a car you could fit in. <laughs> right uh it's a, a, it's a bar. yeah other than, the, other than the xke that i had that i uh i never could even close the door but uh yeah the, little, the arguably, arguably the most beautiful car in the world um i would agree i would think it's uh definitely up there um uh again with the aston martins um now we didn't get into too much dodge stuff because uh, we don't have to every week although i do have some dodge news <laughs> but before we do that uh uh, reminder, your friends at Dodge, give your uh, local Dodge dealer a call. See what they got for you. They'll bring you performance, technology, and great deals. There's never been a better time now because Dodge is still offering their great power dollars incentive. The power dollars you'll get with power dollars, you'll get $10 off for each horsepower of your new car. So that every 2019 Dodge Charger, every 2019 Challenger, uh, it's all part of the deal. That means you can pull away in a 2019 Dodge Charger RT Scat Pack and get 485 uh, with 485 horsepower and get an almost $5,000 cash allowance. So if you get more power, you get more off. It's that simple. So hurry over and uh, give your local Dodge dealer a call and take advantage of Dodge Power Dollars. 
Uh, speaking of Dodge, I'll just wrap this up. This isn't a plug for them. It just happens to be in the news. Um, the Dodge Durango is due for a new platform, and uh, it's uh, similar to Jag. They, they will have to do something a little more fuel efficient, so there will be a hybrid version of, uh, of the Dodge Durango. Um, it'll probably be mated with a V6. It'll have a V6 gas engine. It'll have some electric motors, a hybrid version. Um, I think that's what they're doing with the Ram 1500 as well. Uh, so expect a, a 3.6 liter uh, V6 um, and a hybrid version. They'll have their V8 version, their Hemi Power V8, um, the 5.7 liter V8. Uh, they will do their SRT version, I believe. Uh, no reason to not have the 6.4 liter V8. Uh, V8 and that that's the 707 horsepower version but what's interesting is is I believe we're going to see a Hellcat version as well now they never really wanted to do the Hellcat version because two reasons one they didn't want to take away from the Trackhawk having the 797 horse and and these guys having the 797 horse and then also what does it do to the price of a Durango when they wanted separation between the you know the track hawk and the now competitor um yeah which is especially interesting because the 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 jeep is going to get a three-row version at some point right so the next platform so now the durango is going to be a three-row is a three-row and the jeep will be a three-row and they'll both have the uh the big Hellcat okay. engine, the big 797 horsepower. I, you know, now what are we talking about? Just a trim model difference, a little bit of brand loyalty difference at this point. Um, I, I don't know. Let's, I, I drove the Trackhawk and that thing is, that thing is ridiculously fun. Every time you mash the gas on that thing with the all wheel drive, you just, you just start screaming. This thing is doing things that SUV shouldn't be doing. So to that credit now, look, the Lamborghini Urus does the same thing. That thing's batshit crazy fast and sounds awesome. Yeah, for and, uh, four times the amount of money. Yeah, for for a <laughs> lot of money. So uh, I'm a fan of the Trackhawk. Um, I'd like to see what they do with the Durango. I was a little iffy on the design. It gets a little bubbly in the back. And I get that's yeah. more of the utility of it than the uh, uh, than uh, than anything else, but. Um, it'd be interesting to see uh, how this ends up with its with its facelift design and and what it gets. But um, look, people are going to go and have fun with it. And uh, somebody was asking me like, what? Why would you get the Trackhawk versus whatever SUV like a Stelvio Quattrofolio or something like that? And I say, all these super fast, super uh, uh, over the top, uh, crazy SUVs. The Trackhawk is the one you want to get when you want to modify it as well. Because you can make a thousand horsepower with that thing. Easy. And Easy. It, it, it handles it pretty good. The driveline in that, it is, it, it's built to handle crazy power. And for that yeah. reason. Um, and that I'm, reason alone. I'm, I'm a fan of it for that. Really yeah. for that. Because there's no way. I would be getting a track copy. Like I feel like there's a pulley swap. It's some exhaust going on. Definitely it's going on. Definitely. Because well, those two cars sitting behind you right now, super fun. But until you get an all-wheel drive version of one of those things, track hawk is the only option out there. If yeah. you want those things to hook up. But uh, all right. Anyway, we got to wrap this up. I've got another podcast and Adam's going to tune in in just a second. But um, thanks, buddy. So next week, I think we're going to have Alistair Weaver back on with us. He's cool. going to jump in and, uh, and we'll chat with him as well. So we always love when Alistair comes on. But, um, uh, anything else we're missing? No, man. Just doing Hoonigans here in about an hour. So uh, check oh, me nice. out. There, man. Should be nice. It could be up on their channel, up their YouTube channel. and uh, Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You got it, man. Right. Man, cool. I think Mario's going to jump on afterwards. We're going to talk a little bit about the twin turbo that should be done in 57 days. We'll see. Oh, that seems very precise. <laughs> all right. All right, you know. uh, all right. So what we'll do is we'll follow your uh, your social media to find out about when the Hoonigan stuff posts. Follow uh, uh, Goldberg uh, uh, 95 and Goldberg uh, Goldberg's Garage on Instagram and follow that. Um, you can follow me at Motorator as well, and I'll post some photos of uh, – 
of the Aston Martin. But uh, all right, guys, thank you so much. And until next time, keep the air in the spare and the bag in the wheel. And all four tires on the pavement. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs>